lecture to seeing where the rapture is in the book of Revelation. And that's our main goal today. But before we do, I want to review this diagram with you. Here we are. And it would appear that we're about to hear the sixth trumpet. We've gone through the details right here of the sixth trumpet. And uh, and chapter 12 is the intermission chapter. And then there's a seventh trumpet that occurs here. And the scripture says that the distance between the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet, the time between the two is very short. And the seventh trumpet is actually the beginning of what is called the woes. It is the outpouring, the seventh trumpet is the seven vials, the seven outpourings of wrath. Now I want to change the diagram just slightly so it'll make room for us on here to help us just get a little background for where we are today. Everybody better first say, God help the preacher. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Now watch the uh, intelligent monitor, intelligence monitor with me for a moment. I want you to see this line. Because this, this is a seven and seven year period here. And during the first three and a half years, we have the rise of the Antichrist. And that's why this, this day of the Lord shall not come here until their first <clears throat> the wicked one is revealed. And so he rises to power, and we spend a lot of details on what the Antichrist is like and how to recognize him. But in the middle of the seven-year tribulation, there's a sound of a trumpet, the seventh trumpet. And the seventh trumpet signals these outpourings of wrath. Now watch this, because what happens now is he goes into severe decline after the, after the middle of this tribulation period. And this leads to the biggest war of all wars, the battle of Armageddon. And we're going to come to Armageddon. And what we're going to do probably in the next couple of Sundays is going to fill you in the details on what's going to happen here. Uh, what are these uh, outpourings of God's wrath, what are they? And then what's going to happen here in this battle of Armageddon? And then we're going to go into, well, what happens going forward from here? And the Bible is clear in its presentation of these truths. So uh, today, however, um, I want you to understand that the seven-year period is divided in half. And the first part is called the tribulation. The last part, by the way, is called the great tribulation. Two different phrases referring to this total seven-year tribulation, also referred to as the time of Jacob's trouble. And, uh, <clears throat> but the difference between the tribulation, first three and a half years, and the last three and a half years, is this thing called God's wrath is happening. Now, I, I wasn't sure how much details to give you on this, but I'm going to give you the chapters and verses for them. And you will discover, in fact, we'll do that next week. We're going to go into the details of this God's wrath thing here. What are these seven vials of God's wrath? And what's going to, what you're going to find is interesting about it, I think, is that when these seven acts of wrath from God are poured out on the earth, Everyone in heaven at that time will be rejoicing in the judgment because the judgment of God on the earth will be seen universally as the just and right and true thing to do. No different than when a, a, a judge on the bench and is a, in the court of the land has to pass a judgment and this perpetrator who did the killing and the murder or whatever the event was uh, gets proper justice, and there is rejoicing when there is judgment in the land. And it will be seen universally that these seven outpourings of God's wrath 
are the right, loving, proper thing for God, the judge of the whole universe, to do. They will not be seen by people who properly can perceive. They will not be perceived as unjust, but they will be rejoicing over the proper judgments of God. So, with that as the background, I want to take you into the subject now of where the rapture occurs in the book of Revelation. Now, we get the insights of Revelation from other books of the Bible. And so I want to go to this Corinthian passage first. And here is what it says. This is a song we just sung, changed in the twinkling of an eye. And so this rapture, which is the evacuation of the planet, or, or from the planet, of every true, blood-bought, born-again, Bible-believing, Jesus-exalting Christian. Going to be the greatest event in airlift history. We're just going out of here. And it's going to happen in one moment. Not going to take a long time. And, and I want you to get rid of your fears that you got from the movies produced. There will not be a pile of clothes left there. You will not go up without clothes. So don't get worried about that, even though we, we've been shown that way. But it's going to happen in a moment. Now watch this. In a moment. And then it says, in the twinkling of an eye. Now this is an original illustration from the Bible, but has been, it has been used throughout history. In fact, in Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice, he uses the phrase, the twinkling of an eye. It is a phrase that has come to convey the suddenness and the immediacy of an event. In a twinkling of an eye. Now, I don't know how fast that is. I have been told by some that a twinkling of an eye, I don't know if that's a blink or just a twinkle in your eye, but it's something like one four hundredth of a second. And it's going to happen that fast. Now watch this, because here's what the scriptures are teaching. It's going to happen in a moment. It's going to happen in a twinkling of an eye. Now watch this, because it's going to happen at the last trump. Not just any trump, the last trump. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, now watch this, for the trumpet shall sound. Which trumpet? The last trumpet shall sound. The dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed immediately. You will receive your glorified body. And we'll be evacuated from here. It's going to happen in a moment. It's going to happen in a twinkling of an eye. And it's going to happen at the last trumpet. Now, here's another passage about the rapture. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. So the Apostle Paul is saying, I'm not making this up. I got this from the Lord. That we which are alive and remain Unto the coming of the Lord, okay, until he comes back for this event, we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them that are dead, that sleep. We'll not, yeah, we're going, but that doesn't mean they're going to get left behind. And it shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself, isn't this ever good news? The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel, and look at this, and with the trump of God. And the dead will rise first. Next verse. Then we which are alive at that time and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And from now on, we shall ever be with the Lord. So, look at this next verse now. Comfort one another with this. 
Now, this is really important to get this. Because, and in fact, I'm going to conclude today by helping us develop a positive outlook on what's going to happen. Even though when we get into the seven vials, the seven bowls of God's wrath, when you see what's going to happen at Armageddon, when you understand what's going to happen even in the first three and a half years of this tribulation period, it is not a pretty picture. But the danger is we should look at all this bad stuff that's happened and not realize the big event that really is happening, and that is the taking away of God's people. Now, I want you to grasp several things. Number one, it's going to happen in a moment. Number two, it's going to happen in the twinkling of an eye. Number three, it's going to happen at the last trumpet. And there are seven trumpets, so it's going to happen at the seventh trumpet. Remember our diagram. And it's going to happen at the same time with the trumpet sound. The voice of the archangel is going to sound. And what's going to happen is the dead in Christ are going to come first up. And we which, if we're alive at that time and remain, shall be caught up to meet him with the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Pardon me. And now, brothers and sisters, comfort one another with this. Doesn't matter what's going on out there and how bad it gets, this is the comfort for you. I used to have a song a long time ago. I liked it. It won't be long till we'll be leaving here. You know, you know McDonald's years ago had an ad Keep your eyes on the fries. <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the Christians at that time would get a new version. Keep your eyes on the skies. We'll be leaving here. Now, my biggest temptation is to start telling you what's going to happen the moment we leave here. First of all, we're going to meet the Lord. Secondly, we'll never be separated from him again. But there's a whole series of extraordinary events that take place for you. And it is my intentions to demonstrate those to you, both from Scripture and reason, in the next coming weeks. Because we're not going out of here just to sit on a cloud and float around in heaven somewhere. God's got big plans for you. Do you know what he's got? He's got a whole series of rewards for you. Seven distinct rewards for you. We're going to go into the details of them. You ought to know what your inheritance will be. You ought to know what's coming. Most people are motivated by one of two things, either the hope of reward or the fear of punishment. Some people are more motivated by the fear of punishment than they are the hope of reward. Well, in this case, both, both are working. <laughs> There's stuff you want to avoid here. But the hope of reward... We, we just don't hear enough about the rewards. In business, the people who really do well, one of the features is they're, they're hungry for they're hungry for business. They, they, they want to make it happen. And, and there's some people in business who, who are motivated by a fear of failure. Of not having enough money to pay their bills. And bills can be expensive. Medical bills. I got a shock on my life. Last night, got the bill from the hospital. Remember I had that little thing thing? That unsuccessful surgery cost $88,000. <laughs> I 
Yes, yeah, right. And I'll be based on it. It worked, but it didn't. And he thought, you, you, you know, thank God for insurance and making wise choices ahead of time. Some people are motivated in business by the fear of loss. Some people are just motivated by the reward. Most of us are a mixture of both. And what I want to spend time with you on is your rewards. The Bible is clear about them. They are very exotic. They are so fabulous that it ought to motivate you not to ever want to sin again. You say, well, preacher, where is that in the Bible? Scripture says, do you not know that it is the goodness of the Lord that leads to repentance? So somewhere we have lost the vision of what, we're, what's, what this thing is about. We've just kind of like, we've just kind of said, well, there's a heaven up there somewhere, and, we're probably, and, and, and it would be preferable to the other place. And we don't know very much about it. We don't know what we're going to do there. And the details have been left out. But I tell you, that when you see what God has prepared for you, you can't imagine. We go to that sixth chapter of Isaiah, remember, or uh, Corinthians rather, I have not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed it unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God, and God hath revealed it unto us by a Spirit. We are going to look in these pages and see what the Spirit says God has prepared for you. How exciting that will be. All right. So comfort yourself. You know, last, you know, two weeks ago, we, we dealt with, uh, you know, we dealt with this uh, rise of the Antichrist, and probably surprising to, in fact, some of you mentioned it to me, they had never heard before that while the Antichrist desires to be the world leader and the leader of the world, he doesn't really ever achieve that, and that there will be entire nations who will not be subject to him. Now, that aggravates some people who love prophecy. Because they're like the they're they're like the uh, the Irishman who likes to fight. You know, he's walking down the street and he comes across the fight and he says to the guy, "Hey, is this a private fight or can anybody join in?" I mean, anything. That, you know, the, some people just bring it on. They want to get in the fight. You know, they they hey, let the come on, Antichrist, let's go. And they want to rumble. You know, and when they find out that there is oppose, opposition to the Antichrist, uh, and it may not happen to them. And, uh, and they would rather go out and buy their survival gear. And they're not saying they should never do that, but, uh, but, but they have an itch to, you know, to get it on. When in fact, the Antichrist, has the extent of his kingdom is very limited, as we saw uh, several weeks ago. All right. Now, this rapture, it takes place in a moment... In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, and before the wrath of God. Because the last trumpet is the signal of the outpouring of God's wrath. <clears throat> so back here. The wrath begins here. The seventh trumpet happens here. Okay? So let's look at the scripture. There followed another angel saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, we covered this already, if any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in the forehead, not on the forehead, or in the hand, not on the hand, subdermal, remember? 
The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. I want you to notice where you are. You're in chapter 14. So here is the promised wrath of God going to happen in the middle of this tribulation period. It's happening here. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, watch the diagram, at the last trump, and before the wrath is poured out on those who take the mark, either in the forehead or in the hand. Now let's go to chapter 15. I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues. For in them is filled up the wrath of God. The wrath of God is defined by seven specific, referred to some places as plagues, referred to another place in chapter 16 as the vials, you'll see in a moment. Some places called the bowls, of judgment. They are the wrath of God. And so I want you to understand this wrath of God event is going to happen. And I heard another voice. Here we are in chapter 16. I heard a voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, go your ways, pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. So here we are. Before this time, the tribulation has not been a result of God's activity, but man's activity. God starts in at the middle of this tribulation, at the last trump, and now he's going to bring justice to the world. And so his wrath is poured out uh, by these seven angels. So here it is. This is the trumpet sounding here. And this rapture takes place there. And then this wrath happens. Now, I want you to know that you won't be here for the wrath. Look at the scripture now. Now, again, remember, this is a Thessalonian passage. Thessalonians next to Matthew 24 and Luke 21 and the book of Revelation is the most plentiful book on prophecy in the New Testament. Next to Revelation. All right. So here we are. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we sleep or whether we live together with him. Whether we're there. Now watch. Salvation happens in at least Three tenses. Let me see if I can help you with this. When you become a saved by Jesus person, you are saved in the past tense from the penalty of your sin. Right? You are saved in the present tense from the power of sin. Sin shall no longer have dominion over you. You are saved in the future tense by the, from the presence of sin. And that's what's going to happen here. This salvation, you have not been appointed to wrath, but your salvation includes taking you out of the very presence of sin. Saved in the past tense from the penalty of sin. Saved in the present tense from the power of sin. Saved in the future tense at this moment in history that's coming from the very presence of sin. We'll be leaving here. But I want you to get that this rapture happens before the wrath of God. Not before the tribulation. It happens in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. And it happens before the outpouring of the wrath of God. So here, here we are now in the book of Revelation talking about the rapture. Now notice what the scripture says. Here, let me just go back here. That's, well, that's Thessalonians. Okay, watch here now. 
Here is the patience of the saints. Here is what the saints have waited for. Here are they that, now who are the saints? There are those that keep the commandments of God and who keep the faith of Jesus. Okay? Here it is in the book of Revelation. Now in Thessalonians, you've already seen the verses about the rapture. Where is it in Revelation? Here it is. It's talking about this wrath, talking about this seventh trumpet. But now here's the patience of the thing. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are they which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And upon the cloud sat one like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Now, this is important, because in this chapter, you will discover that there are two sickles. Okay? This is the first sickle. In the first sickle, another, uh, and another angel came out and, of the temple, crying for a loud voice to him that sat on the, thr- on the cloud, the Lord himself. Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, Lord. It is time for the harvest of the earth is ripe. This is the rapture, if you please. This is the putting in of the sickle and taking out the harvest that the Lord has waited for all this time. Look at the next verse. And he that sat on the cloud, which is the Lord himself, <clears throat> thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Now, we know what Scripture says and means because we compare it with other Scriptures. So let's go to Luke chapter 21. Now, Luke 21 is the parallel chapter to Matthew 24, which is about the coming of the Lord. And here it is. And there shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. They shall see the Son of Man coming in clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of the trumpet. No miss that. With the sound of the trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven unto another. And this is precisely the Revelation John's description of the taking away of the harvest prophesied by Jesus himself when he says the Son of Man is going to come, he's going to send his angels at the sound of the great trumpet and they shall gather together the elect is the harvest all of the saints are leaving here notice here, before the wrath of God. Now there's another sickle coming and uh, <clears throat> I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about it next week when we cover the woes because it's going to be a gathering of those that are not the elect unto judgment, but we'll cover that. What I want to conclude with today is I, I want us to get a viewpoint of the book of Revelation and of the tribulation and of these end times because I've, I've already talked to you about a whole lot of the bad stuff that's going to happen. And when I was preparing, I thought to myself, you know, we need this final exhortation, and I want you to see this. The book of Revelation is not designed as a revelation of the wrath of God, although that is there. The book of Revelation is not designed as a revelation of the Antichrist, although it tells about him and the beast, the false prophet. The book of Revelation has all those elements in it, but here's what I want you not to miss. The book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
When you look at the book of Revelation, especially after preachers, myself included, have told you about the seven vials, and we've told you about the first six trumpets, and we've told you about the wars and rumors of wars and the earthquakes and all the stuff that's going on, the danger is that that's what you would think about when you think about the book of Revelation. God wants you to see that the essential subject in the book of Revelation is Jesus Christ. The opening verse of the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave unto John to show the servants things which must shortly come to pass. That's all there. But it's the revelation of Jesus. Now, I want to conclude today with an admonition to all of us to make sure that what you look at, now it's okay to, to see the judgments. It's okay to see what the Antichrist is going to do. It's okay to observe Armageddon. I'm telling you, it's going to be fulfilled. Wait till you get, wait till we get you next week into chapter 16, uh, chapter 15 and 16 on, on these vials, and you're going, to, you're going to see the bombs going off starting next week. In, that, in this last three and a half years, John, John says he saw an earthquake, the biggest that had ever happened in the human history. Well, if you were John and you saw a bomb, an atomic bomb go off, how would you describe it 2,000 years ago where they didn't even know what bombs were? You would call it an earthquake. And he did. He saw hail. That's what he called it. Falling out of the skies, every one of them the size of a talent. The weight of a talent. A talent is 100, 114 pounds. He called it hail. Because he's trying to describe 2,000 years ago stuff that didn't exist in their day. And when he gets to Armageddon, he's going to give us a clear description of Armageddon in terms of the day and age in which he lived. But we have to look at it, given... That's why the book of Revelation is one of the books, like Daniel, which is shut up until the last time. Couldn't be understood, because none of the technologies that he saw existed till now. And yes, we're going to see Armageddon. We're going to visit all of the scenes prophetically described but my friends, this morning, the greatest concern I have as a pastor is that we don't miss the essence of the book of Revelation, which is Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Yeah. And so what do I want to say to you about that this morning? I want to say it's okay to know, to know the rest of prophecy, but you want to be looking at Jesus. Don't be looking at the tribute. Don't, no, let me show you why. This is a wonderful scripture that begs preaching for hours. The book of Hebrews chapter 12. And I would love to do the end of 11 and 12 with you, but here's what it says. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now watch this. Looking unto Jesus. We know the bombs are going to go off. We know the Antichrist is going to rise to power. We know the mark of the beast is coming in the right hand and in the forehead. Subdermal implants with technological information about your whole history, your DNA, everything medical, etc. Tracking devices built into human beings that submit to the Antichrist. So when you walk into a room... Your RFID tag is emitting from your body using the energy of heat and, and self-energizing movements of the body, 
providing the energy to this electronic device and all of that is true. But if that's all we see, we have missed the entire book of Revelation. Let me show you why this is important. Looking unto Jesus. Watch this now. The author of your faith. If you look at the Antichrist, he will author fear. If you look at the false prophet, if you look at the things that are going to happen on the earth, and that becomes your eye focus, they will not author faith. And these are days when we should be walking by faith and not by sight. Not by sight. Well, how do you get faith? You get faith from looking to Jesus. He is the author of faith. Now, watch this, because this is loaded. Not only will, if you look to Jesus, you will have faith. In spite of what's going on in the world, you will have faith, and it will keep you optimistic, and you've got a hope, a glorious hope, that fades not away, eternally provided for you in the heavenlies. You'll have faith to keep on going, faith to not be depressed, faith not to be discouraged, faith never to give up, because you look in the right place. Now, where you look is really important. Yesterday, I had a rare privilege. I was given a complimentary day at the racetrack in Gainesville. And uh, my instructor was, uh, gosh, I can never remember his name. Harley Haywood, world, Hurley Haywood, rode in my car with me. And I even rode in his cheap old Porsche. And uh, he was my instructor for the day. to uh, Bruno's AMG school for power driving, speed driving, stuff like that. I always wanted to see what this car I got would do, so I found out yesterday. So we had lectures for an hour, and then we went to the track. The first activity on the track was high-speed uh, slalom. So you got to stretch a track down there, and right down the middle of the track is all these orange cones, place part, and you leave the start line at full throttle, and you enter the chute at about 60 to 70 miles an hour, and then you got to navigate through these things. I would love to have had my wife there. She would have been a lot more spiritual today than she was yesterday if she'd been there. <laughs> when you get down to the other end, you do an immediate U-turn, you accelerate as fast as your car will go back to the other end. You do an immediate 90-degree turn, and you slam on the brakes, and you put your ABS, you put the brakes on the floor, and you leave them there. Now, Hurley took me through it the first time. He was a driver. I was the passenger. Then I was the passenger, and he was a the driver. Then he got out of the car and says, okay, you do it by yourself now. And I had about another eight or ten goes at it. And he said... Johnston, I want to tell you the most important thing about doing this right. I said, yeah, I'm really waiting for some really good advice here. And he said, it's where you put your eyes. Because your eyes will automatically tell your hands and feet what to do. Ah, okay, well, okay, all right. So I have paid attention, which was a mistake. And the second time down the track, I took out two cones because I was looking at the cones. He said, so here are the cones lined up, one here, another one here. 
He says, when you're making these turns, this is high speed, he says, you want your eyes in the middle, not on the cones. So I thought, well, okay, I goofed that time, I'll try it. And sure enough, when I put my eyes where he told me to put my eyes, the car did exactly what it was supposed to do the way it was supposed to do it. It all depends on where you put your eyes. You know, years ago in the agricultural environment, men used to plow fields with the horses and etc. Donkey, not donkeys, but oxen. And they used to have contests, even when I was a kid, about who could plow the straightest furrows. And they told me back in those days that the secret of being able to plow straight was to not look where you were going, but look where you wanted to end up. And if you set your eyes on the other end of the field on some object and then just plow looking there, your furrow is going to be really straight. The danger of the teaching on the book of Revelation is that it is sensational. But the risk is that it's so sensational, it would get our eyes on the wrong thing. Because wherever you set your eyes, your hands and feet follow. Now, I proved that yesterday over and over again. I didn't know that you could drive a car at high speed. I mean, I'm turning, I'm turning a constantly, constant radius circle at high speed where, where the car is about to break loose and spin out. And I'm not allowed to turn the steering wheel to steer it. I didn't believe that you could steer a car with a gas pedal. It's called oversteering and understeering. But it all went back to the eyes. My friends, what I want us to leave here with today is that after everything we learned and all the spectacular and all the, I mean, this is high, I mean, the book of Revelation is high power stuff. But we can never let any of it take our eyes. Off the subject of the book of Revelation, which is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the scripture comes along and says, now, looking unto Jesus, there are a number of dynamics that occur when we follow the instruction of any scripture, but especially this one. Let me show you the dynamics in this verse. If you look unto Jesus, you'll have faith. And what's coming on the world right now? You want to have faith. You look at the stuff, you'll have fear, uncertainty, chaos, questions. You look at Jesus, and he will author a faith in your heart. Now watch this, because he not only will author faith, but he'll make sure that the faith that he authors gets finished. He's the author and the finisher of your faith. And what you believe will come to pass. He authors the faith, and he'll make sure it comes to be. A couple more references to this, because I don't, I don't want you to miss this, the importance of this. And by the way, couple more dynamics here as it helps you to lay aside weights and sins that otherwise beset you, but keep looking at him. 
Here's Isaiah's summary of the same thing. Look unto me. Look unto me. This is God speaking through the prophet. Look unto me and be saved. All the ends of the earth, for I am God, there's none else beside me. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness. and shall not return. Here is the word, it's quoted in the New Testament, that unto me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear, shall confess. Look unto me. It's the message of the book of Revelation. Here Isaiah, hearken to me. Ye that follow after, seek the, ye that seek the Lord, look unto the rock from whence you were hewn. Oh. Therefore I will look unto the Lord. I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Don't be looking at this. Don't be looking at this. You need to know it. We'll, go, we'll all understand this. I'm going to explain this to you. It's right. It's, it's, it, it's just like it's just like it's reading right out of the newspaper. You're going to see it next week and the week after probably. But what you want to be looking for is the Lord who says himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet him in the clouds of the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So, don't miss this one more point of the sword here. This is Luke 21, the parallel passage of Matthew 24, all about the pro what, what's going to be the sign of the end. That's what the disciples asked him. And so Jesus tells them all kinds of stuff that's going to come down. And this is his final instruction to them about when the fireworks get started. When these things begin to come to pass, look up. Lift up your heads. Now that phrase, lift up your heads, is not merely a literal lift up your head is an idiom, an expression that refers to people who don't have their heads down in discouragement, in worry. When the stuff of revelation starts to happen, and it's happening, the fireworks are on now. Don't let it rule your thinking or your emotions. How do you prevent it? By lifting up your heads. Lift up your eyes. Lift up your heads. Look. Your redemption draws nigh. And the author and the finisher of your faith will not only give you faith, but he'll see it to completion. And you will go out of here with victory. The victory is not simply the departure. That certainly is part of the victory. But the victory is that God wants you to have it from now till rapture. Until you leave here, how do you have the victory? It's determined by where you set your eyes. So don't, I mean, you, you want to know about the vials. You want to know about the plagues. You want to know about the, all the stuff. Yeah, but that's not where you want to focus your eyes. You want to keep your eyes 
fixed on Jesus. You know what? You'll be all right. The ravens will feed you if they have to. He will give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways, to bear thee up in their hands, lest you even dash your foot against a stone. Lift up your heads, my friends. Don't let the book of Revelation and all of the dramatic and exciting things that are going to happen, you need to know them, but that's not where we put our eyes. We keep our eyes on the subject of the book of Revelation, found in verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Will you say amen to that? Hallelujah.